So, Breath of the Wild. People seem to think it's alright, and I'm inclined to agree with them. It's one of the best games that I've played recently, though I'm not sure if that's saying much since I don't really play all that many games. Still, it gets a glowing recommendation from me. If you have a Wii U, you should definitely buy it, and if you have a Switch, then you already bought it. The game does have its fair share of problems. Greatest game of all time? Eh, not so sure. That being said, I'm not here today to complain. I'm actually here to dispute one big gripe people have with this game. It's towers. For those who aren't aware, towers have become this reoccurring staple in open world games recently. The idea is that when you go to a new part of the game, you have to climb up some kind of boring copy-pasted tower, and when you get to the top, the game fills in your map for that particular region with a bunch of missions. This has been a feature in pretty much every single Ubisoft open world game released in the last decade, and people are starting to get pretty sick of it. There are a bunch of problems with them. For one, these towers are often emblematic of the kind of recycled paint-by-numbers content that you see in massive open-world games. They do pretty much the same thing every time you come to one. Start climbing, solve some basic and probably reused platforming puzzles, get to the top, press a thing, wooshy wooshy camera angles, get back down. But I really don't mind the towers in Breath of the Wild. In fact, I kinda liked them? Now, I've got to admit, it could just be that I don't have the same open-world tower fatigue that some of you guys do. I haven't played a one of those Ubisoft open-world games, so maybe I'd hate Zelda's towers just as much as everyone else if I'd had to personally live through this trope instead of just passively seeing and hearing about it. But I think there's enough going on with Zelda's towers to distinguish them from their predecessors. The most obvious change to the tower concept here is that going up these towers doesn't dump a bunch of information on you. In other games, these towers provide clear markers that indicate specific specific events or things that you can find in the world. In Breath of the Wild, all that you get is a regional topography map. You'll be able to see the names of particular mountains, forests, or rivers, but you won't get anything else. Any man-made structures, like bridges, stables, shrines, or towns, you'll have to find on your own before they get marked on your map. Instead of giving you all of that information, the game expects you to use your vantage point from the top of the tower to scout the area out visually. You can use your magical iPad like it's a telescope and look for any interesting landmarks. Points of interest, like shrines, have bright lights on the side which make them easy to spot, but you do still have to put in the effort to actually spot them. The difference here is that Breath of the Wild's towers enable the player's own exploration instead of dumping a checklist of tasks on them. The player is supposed to navigate by their own instinct and adventurous spirit instead of dev team designated waypoints. Instead of the space between checklist tasks becoming an empty, useless wasteland, players have to engage with the entire world, combing the countryside to find secrets and activities. And that's what exploration is all about! That's important, because Breath of the Wild has been praised for the way that it promotes exploration, and encourages players to venture through every nook and cranny of its world. As I was just saying, the cool thing here is that the adventure isn't dictated to the player. The game gives you a quest, so you do have objectives and some hard and fast rules, but it doesn't tell you what to do within that framework. You can follow the main story quest markers strictly until you get to the end of the game, but you can also go in completely the opposite direction and have just as fulfilling a gameplay experience. Your enjoyment of the game's written plot might suffer, but you'll build your own adventure. There's enough stuff in this world that you really can have a good time no matter where you go. That brings us to another issue that people have with Breath of the Wild's towers, though. In a game that mostly encourages you to go wherever you want, whenever you want, why can't you get the map of a given region until you scale its corresponding tower? You see, every time that you go to a new part of the game's world, your map is completely blank. Only after you find that region's tower, climb it, and activate it is your map actually filled in. Why is a game that's all about exploring at your own pace handicapping you until you complete a specific task? That isn't very adventurous. Well, there are a couple of reasons I think Nintendo handled things this way. Let's consider the other ways they could have given the player a map. There's the first obvious option, filling it in as you explore. There would be a radius around the player character, and as you travel the world, the areas that you walk through would be detailed on your map. The areas that you don't venture to remain mysterious. The other obvious option is they just give you the whole map right away. These two approaches seem like they exist on opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Either give the player no information, or give them all of the information. But the interesting thing is that they're actually remarkably similar. Consider what the player will see under each system. They'll either look at a completely blank map, or a map with far more detail than they can initially take in. It doesn't matter which one you go with, because either way, players will say the same thing. Where do I start? Now, in Breath of the Wild, after you clear the Great Plateau, you can venture out in any direction that you choose. North, south, east, west, wherever. 
Will you follow that fancy new quest marker you just got and go and find Impa? Will you recklessly sprint straight towards Hyrule Castle? Will you head for those dry, barren mountains? Or the huge lake? Or that mysterious flying silhouette out in the distance? These are all choices you'd have to make no matter what map system the game was implementing. But once you leave the plateau and whenever you enter a new region, you're faced with yet another question of where do I go? This game is huge and you don't really know what you'll find when you walk to a new part of the world. Well, except for the stuff that you can plainly see from a distance. That area's got a volcano. This one's got a swamp. That one's got the big bridge where you fight Gilgamesh. That one has the improbable Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis! At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, localized entirely within your mountain top. Yes. Getting around on foot in these places can take you a long time. Since you will rarely have a clear objective in a new region, wandering around aimlessly and covering little ground could get pretty frustrating. Now, if we're using the system where the game just gives you the entire map right away, you won't necessarily be wandering aimlessly. You might spot a town on the map, but that's not very adventurous. Even if the map is just topographical, if you're picking out bodies of water or mountains that you haven't actually seen with your own eyeballs yet, but that you've seen on your map, well, what's so adventurous about that? There isn't a real moment of wandering into the unknown, and that's kind of a critical component of adventure. Alternatively, if you make it so that the game fills in your map as you move along... Okay, well let me tell you right now, you're never going to finish that map. My brother and I played this game for a long time. We did all the main story quests, we did quite a bit of unnecessary extra exploring, and I belabored the crap out of going to fight the final boss. Point being, I saw a lot of this world. And you know what? I barely found half the shrines. And Korok Seeds? Can't exactly claim I was approaching the 900 mark. Even after my brother put more time into the game and cleared every single shrine and chased down all the dragons for their stupid loot drops, I guarantee you he still hadn't explored the entire map. So if we were working off of that system, people would have ugly unfinished maps like this one by the end of their games. And despite the differences between these two systems, as I said before, they have a common problem. This is way too daunting. It's so open-ended that, I mean, where do I even start? Where do I go? What do I do? A lot of players would probably just wind up running around in completely empty wilderness for 30 minutes and go, oh, well, I guess this is the game then, and give up. But no, that doesn't happen. Breath of the Wild keeps its map and its details hidden from you, so you have to venture out into unknown territory, navigating off your own gut instinct but you always have one consistent objective. It doesn't matter if you're wandering into a dense jungle or a snowy mountain range completely devoid of civilization. There's a tower out there somewhere for you to find, and that should always be your first goal. Get to high ground, spot the tower, head there. Along the way, you'll probably run into some enemies, maybe a cave with some treasure or a shrine or even a settlement or two. Just by giving you slight direction, you always have something definite to work towards, even as you explore through unfamiliar, uncharted territory. So yes, Breath of the Wild is a game about exploring at your own pace and discovering things on your own. But its world is so big and has so much to do that they kind of need to give you some sort of objective whenever you walk into a new area. Otherwise, things would be overwhelming. And thankfully, the unwritten objective that you're given encourages you to explore, and rewards you by enhancing your ability to explore, instead of just, uh, I don't know, checking something off your list or giving you some money or whatever. So, point being, these towers help Breath of the Wild's sense of exploration instead of hindering it. But there is yet another thing that people like to complain about when it comes to these towers, and I feel compelled to dispute it. The other frequent complaint about these towers is that once you get to them, they're all basically the same, and... Uh, yeah, they've got a point there. All of these towers look identical. They may have platforms placed at different spots, or a ton of platforms, or no platforms at all, but at the end of the day, they've all got this same mesh stuff on the side, and you climb up them, and you turn on the same computer and watch the same cutscene. However, the areas surrounding these towers are really different from one another. They all throw a different type of challenge at you, or offer some different way of approaching the tower. All of the towers in this game can be cheated if you stock up on stamina restoring items, or if you already have Revali's Gale. But if you have a low amount of stamina, and you don't have the ability to magically fly into the air at any time, some of these towers offer a navigational challenge. Like with this one, it's out in the middle of a boiling pool, so you can't swim out to it. You can use your ice ability to reach the tower, but if this is one of the first towers a player has come to, then they probably won't have enough stamina to reach the first platform. But you can use your ice or bombs to knock these big stone pillars over and give yourself a bit of a head start. 
From here, you can make it all the way to the top of the tower, even with the base amount of stamina. That tower isn't guarded by any enemies, but the central tower, which has a decent chance of being the first tower a player comes to, is surrounded on all sides by damaged guardians. These enemies can't chase you, but a new player probably won't be able to take them out, so your ascent up the tower involves trying to get from platform to platform quickly enough to evade the deadly lasers that guardians can fire at you. There are some other memorable towers, like this one that tasks you with fighting a bunch of monsters on platforms over a boiling lake and then dodging the attacks of a fire wizard guy while scaling the tower. But my favorite tower in the game is probably the one located on the ruined citadel in Akala. This area is great for a lot of reasons. Breath of the Wild is a big game, and it's cool that we can explore it in whatever way we want, but the developers will want us to see their hard work. How do you make sure that the players see the cooler stuff you make in a game this big? Well, since players will be looking for the tower whenever they go to a new region, you're pretty much guaranteed that they'll see whatever is placed immediately around that tower. So here we have a really unique area, a ruined citadel that was clearly once the site of a great battle. Not only is it a cool location, if you have yet to venture to Hyrule Castle or some of the more secretive parts of the game, this will probably be your first exposure to the Flying Guardians. Imagine the sensation of seeing the tower up on this mountain starting to glide towards it and then one of these pops into view. What is that? In this way, the Citadel kind of becomes its own self-contained level within an open world game. You have to dodge or outrun these flying guys until you reach the summit. Once you make it to the summit, you find that the tower is completely surrounded by this evil Ganon goo. Again, if you have Rivali's Gale, then there's no real trick to getting onto this tower unscathed, but if you don't, you've got to explore these ruins and fight some bad guys and hop from building to building until you find this one little arm you can climb onto and jump onto the tower. You usually don't see this kind of focused, careful level design in an open world game, but by creating this isolated citadel and putting a tower on top of it to attract players, Breath of the Wild is able to slip a finely crafted level into an open world setting. You can see them doing this sort of thing again with the heavily fortified Lanaru Tower. The mountain is crawling with enemies, and the game gives you a bunch of creative and sneaky ways of taking care of them that you might not otherwise see in an open world game. This is part of why a massive game like Breath of the Wild still feels like it has that patented Nintendo polish. It still has the careful, considered level design we would expect from those folks, peppered naturally throughout this massive open world. It uses a lot of tricks to let players stumble upon these cool bits, while still letting everyone explore and discover at their own pace. The shrines are the most obvious place where the game just goes, STOP! It's time for a carefully designed little slice of gameplay and you better enjoy it! But there are less obvious bits. For example, there's the sequence where you have to travel to Zora's Domain, and you have to fight through this narrow valley, and they use that to funnel you into a really well-designed and intense bow and arrow fight. In the same way, the towers are used as points that the developers can expect the player to travel to, so they can put a little bit of extra effort into creating fun challenges or puzzles to be overcome. And oh yeah, that reminds me, in all of those other open world games, once you get to the top of a tower, you've got to ride a scripted zipline back down or jump into a bale of hay or something else just as boring. But in this game, you get a hang glider to go wherever the heck you like. Once again, the towers enable the player's exploration instead of just being the same thing over and over again. Plus, any excuse to use that paraglider, right? Paragliders are like video game crack. Making a generic open world game? Put a paraglider in it. Congrats! You've spontaneously transformed your game into one of the best of its kind. I should reiterate that this game does have its fair share of problems. It does some things wrong. It's fair to say that it does several things wrong. But it also does some things really right. Pretty much everything having to do with Princess Zelda was a thing that they did right. And if you've been on Tumblr lately, then you know that Shark Boy here was a thing that they did right. The towers are also one of the things that they did right. The game provides just enough direction to keep the player motivated, but that direction is broad enough that they still feel like they're exploring. The game also rolls out the world's map in a really appropriate way that encourages exploration, but also provides ample information once the time is right. So please, continue to debate this game. It's got a lot of good and bad that is worth being discussed. But if someone tries to tell you, Eh, I'm so salty that Nintendo don't just made another Ubisoft sandbox clone, then you can tell them no. No, they didn't. And if you could link them back to this video instead of explaining it yourself, that'd be great, because honestly, I could use the views.
Thanks for sticking with this video until the end. This is my first time making something like this, so please tell me what you thought. Was it informative, or did you think it was a cluttered mess? Or do you just really, really disagree with my opinion? I appreciate any and all thoughts and feedback. I have some other videos for your viewing pleasure if you want to check them out. I recommend Final Fantasy XV and the Marketing Campaign of Doom, which is a comprehensive look into what happened during Final Fantasy XV's bizarre 10-year development cycle. And if you want to watch something a little bit more analytical like this video, you can check out that other link.